I want the best out of all the rest. Boxers are our heroes. The spirit of a fighter is someone who doesn't give up. He shouldn't be alive today. The best is to be to come. The swinging 60s brought a social revolution to London and families from the Caribbean, India and Pakistan all arrived in the UK. Joan and Jim Watson were soon on their way from Jamaica to London's Stoke Newington. Michael was born on March the 15th, 1965 at Mother's Hospital Clapton and his brother Geoffrey followed a few years later. Michael was... He was a lovely baby, but he was very soft. Even growing up, he was very soft. The least little thing, Michael would cry, you know. But we give God thanks for him. Like many new families arriving in London, times were tough, and the city wasn't quite the dream destination they had expected. In 1968, the Watson family were involved in a road accident when the brother's pram was hit by a car. I came to the crossing and the bus was coming, a 47 bus. He stopped the rest of the traffic and then he signaled me across. And just as I push off the prom, a car came from nowhere and just took the prom with both children in it. And Jeffrey suffered brain hemorrhage, broken hand, paralyzed side. But in everything, I give God thanks because they are still alive. This was just the start of a series of events which tested Joan's faith. A few months later, a fire swept through their family home in North London. Joan and the two boys escaped with minutes to spare and the flat was completely destroyed. I've been through a lot, a lot, a lot. It was close family friend Joe White who offered the Watsons a place to stay. He became a big part of their lives after their father Jim returned to Jamaica. I was always part of the family since I met them. I loved Michael. In fact, I loved Michael as a son. Joan's strength and determination held the family together and they moved to the de Beauvoir estate in Islington to rebuild their lives. My mother, she's been a true back one. She played a role in being a father and a mother and a brother and a sister, all in one. You know, she, she'd been my entire life. She'd been, a, she inspired me throughout my life. Michael was a timid boy. Growing up in inner London proved challenging. You, you have to be tough, you know. The, everybody likes to play tough and um, Hoxton, Islington, those areas, you know, you just had to know how to take care of yourself. He used to be very soft, he cried for everything. Anything that moves, I'll jump. No, I was just too timid. Oh, look at me now. What, what a transformation, eh? An early confrontation while playing football shaped Michael's future. The big boy bullied me for no reason. Because we won the game. I thought to myself, I can't go go and front my life getting beaten up all the time. I need to learn some martial arts. I used to do some boxing. So I thought the best thing to do is to get him hardened that way. Soon as I put my head through, through the gymnasium, it felt like home. At 14, Michael became a member of the Crown and Manor Amateur Boxing Club and he was an immediate success. Michael was very unique. I saw that he was special and he caught on to the game. So I got someone to train him. Eric Seacombe and Kamal Yalshanu joined forces to train Michael and it was a partnership which lasted for the next 12 years. Kamal saw something special in Michael. My insight told me, you know, this boy one day, big champion. From the beginning, I put those gloves on. I knew I would become more champion. 
Uh, out of China, he named Kamel. He's, he's called me champ from the age of 14. When he called me champ, that encouraged me until I became champion. Michael Watson began brilliantly, winning 18 of his first 20 amateur bouts. Oh, I was so enthusiastic. The adrenaline was pumping. I felt on fire. I used to cheer him on. I used to cheer him, come on, son. Job on move, and we have to support him. But he was a very good fighter. I left Crown and Manor. I went to another club by the name of Culverson. I, they they were sort of players that I was playing with true bigger men. Oh, Christ, what, 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 what have I got myself involved into, right? But as the weeks went on by, I adjusted. And from a bar big, I became a man. As an amateur boxer, he was very good, technically correct, um, great defence, good point picker. Um, but was maturing really, really fast. He was obviously going to be very, very good. I think Michael was a special fighter. You know, there's no question about that. He was very dedicated. You know, technically, one of the best technical fighters in the world, no question. He had a defensive game and he had an offensive game and quiet confidence. When you walk up those four or five stairs into the ring, that's the loneliest place in the world, you know. And Michael was in his element there. He was his opportunity to shine. Michael had an amazing amount of self-belief and I think people around him knew that there was a champion in the wings. On his 19th birthday, Michael fought John Beckles in the 1984 London ABAs. Watson ended the fight in just over 30 seconds and went on to face Russell Barker in the semi-finals. The ABA champion would have the chance to make the Olympic team. I did become a little slightly overconfident. Second fought man by the name of Russell Barker who the label had been the underdog. And when I then got too relaxed, dropped my guard and cracked, he caught me and I went down. Two men here who certainly can dig a bit. Oh, and Parker's got the one in. He's got the big one in and over goes the favourite. It was a bit of a shocking amateur boxing because Michael was a shoe-in, really. I mean, everyone knew he was the quality man in the field. And on the night, it just didn't go well for him. I was heartbroken. Lost my, lost me in my place in the Olympics. Although it was disappointing, the result really didn't matter. Michael turned pro straight off after his uh, disappointment of, of the amateur ABAs, uh, and then showed the world what he could do as a professional boxer. I was suited to become professional. Michael's family were thrilled when he turned pro. They loved it. Mother just loved the the main event and the preparation toward the main event. All my friends, they, they loved it because they're not, they, they're not, I'm a winner. This was a chance for Michael to prove himself on a bigger stage, to take a step up in class and chase the ultimate prize. I'm going to become a world champion and the best. And all the best out of all the rest. That's what, that's what I'm of today, the force. The 1980s was a golden era for Britain's middleweights. Nigel Benn, Chris Eubank and Michael Watson continued a proud tradition. I don't remember there ever being a better time for the middleweight and super middleweight division in the UK. It was unbelievable. And you had Harold Bomber Graham and then we had Michael Watson, we had Chris Eubank, we had Nigel Benn. And you know, they could have fought in any era. They were you know, very, very tough guys. There was such a lot of quality. And then in the middle was this, this really nice guy that could fight. And the public began to warm to him during that period. He wasn't the braggart, he wasn't the showman. He was the false, and the false could fight. Michael Watson teamed up with renowned promoter Mickey Duff ahead of his professional debut against Winston Ray at the Royal Albert Hall. I knew I, I won a fight before it even started. That's not confident, that's self-belief. On the back of that victory, Michael produced a string of sensational performances. Growing in stature, some felt he was even becoming overconfident. His next opponent was the excellent James Cook. 
And for me, it was a great fight to beat Michael Watson because he was the up and coming, he was strong and he was good. And I think virtually they was looking at him, um, this old boy is on his way out. He probably was overconfident because I think um, at the time when I fought Michael, I was on my third loss, you know, so I knew it was going to be hard, but I knew at the end I was going to be stronger. You know, I've just about pipped him, which I'm glad. <laughs> That defeat that's made me who I am. Brought my confidence and became real. To be quite honest, I don't think if he did that, that loss, he'd have put in the work he did. So he owes me. <laughs> Michael returned to the ring with a series of impressive displays in 1986 and 1987. Then he took on dangerous Don Lee from the States. The middleweight division becoming the most exciting in Britain. And what an impact the 22-year-old Londoner Michael Watson can make on it tonight if he can beat the experienced American Don Lee. Don Lee, they used to call him the Cobra. And he could have take hit. So I tell him, you can't hit him outside and stop him like that. What you want to do is to watch him. He can only box going around on the left. He is hopeless, reversing. That's a good left hook over the top from Watson. He's fighting well. I kept him on my toes. I couldn't slack in concentration because he's very sharp. Long arm, he can punch. If I would have got caught by Don, then just Don Lee, he could have put me down. So I had to keep my concentration and stay alert. He brought up short by a punch on the mouth. He's got a damaged mouth. The referee's taken him over to the corner to uh, have a look at it, and it's been stopped. Lee has been stopped with a damaged mouth, a badly damaged mouth. So that's a remarkable win by Michael Watson. Michael Watson certainly showed there what he's going to be capable of in the months and seasons to come. A big clash with the dark destroyer, Nigel Bed now seemed inevitable. Nigel and Michael were being called out as an even match by everybody, all and sundry. Nigel by now was a superstar. Everybody was talking about this fight because Nigel Benn was an awesome pugilist. Nigel Benn had the power in either hand to take anyone out. And, it, and I have to say, probably one of the most exciting fighters of all time. I was just making a load of noise. I was calling out everybody. And the, fight, the person that got my attention was Michael Watson. And uh, I thought to myself, yeah, no problem. I was invincible. I was the best thing since sliced bread. So what can Michael Watson do to me? Both men rose to the challenge and a date was set for their showdown. Knockout King Ben was the aggressor, while Watson, always the gentleman. I went, I went away. Well, I'll try that in the countryside. Just isolate himself for months on end, just get my mind right. Being a loner, it made me hungry. That's my children. Ah. Michael Watson in a press conference was amazing. Very stoic, um, very assured, and Nigel couldn't unnerve him. There's no way I can see this fight going the distance. I'm in the fit shape of my life and I'm ruined to go. He's really gonna get hurt. I'd say, you know, I'm going to hit him so many times with a left, he's going to be crying for a right. The press, they couldn't see me winning in the slightest. They used to actually take the mick out of me. Mike Watson's son, schoolboy. Smooth mover with the hoover. At the time, Michael Jackson was on the Bads tour in England. Um, so we hijacked that by superimposing Nigel's top half onto Michael Jackson's bottom half and of course it was front page news that they were suing us etc but it was great publicity. Yeah I'm bad I remember that yeah yeah it was yeah, we were just we were just selling the fight you know I mean it was seven thousand in a tent like circus tent with seven thousand in there man the atmosphere was electrifying. Everybody wanted to see that fight. We come out there and I remember I, I came in this silver outfit and I had my heel 
down the field a couple of hours before I had my hair really pulled back tight, tight in place. What were they thinking? And he came into the ring and he was absolutely smouldering on fire. But Michael Watson remained unnerved. The bell went and Nigel was just going out to fall out war. Well, he's come out firing as he said he would, Ben, as he always does in a contest. I thought to myself, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to annihilate him for, for the first couple of rounds. It's banging, it's banging. And Michael was just doing that. Like, I've got to put that in my, my head, keep, keep covered up and weather the storm, and then punch yourself out. That's exactly what I did. He winked at my dad to say, I've got your boy, you know? So he knew what he had to do. What an incredible fight. Oh, he's gone. So the big hitter has been hit in the sixth round, and the way he backed off from that punch in the eye, it looked as though he wasn't sure he'd been counted out on his feet there. And I don't think the crowd can believe this. And I know that Ben can't. And to be fair to Ben, he's gone straight over to Watson as if to say, listen, you're the better man. And Michael just hit me with, I think it was just a straight punch. I just went down. I was, I was tired. I was like, I just burnt, I, I just burnt up so much energy. It was just like, I was just exhausted. Well, I saw Nigel, he come out to me. Well, um, I said, I'll tell you I'll be here. I'm testing when he's dead. There was shock and amazement at, at, at Nigel's fans uh, because this is the first time he'd been beaten in 20 odd fights. And, you know, and, and Watson had, in fairness, taken him apart. And I got back to the changing room and it was just me and my jock strap. That was the only thing that was left. Everybody left me and said, look, gotta go, Nigel. I win my head call. <laughs> when we come home, all the horns, and the people upstairs with the band and the music, and it was really tremendous. Despite Watson's fabulous night, the headlines were as much about the Dark Destroyer's comeback, and Michael was in a sense overshadowed. Michael sort of slipped back in a way after that fight. Promotionally, he wasn't pushed in the same manner as I was pushing Eubank and Ben was being pushed. And I can imagine that must have been quite frustrating for Michael. Entrepreneur Barry Hearn teamed up with Michael when he won the purse bid for the world title chance against the body snatcher Mike McCallum. A date was set and both fighters honed their bodies into pristine condition. So many times in Michael's career you can look back and say, what happened if? Things that perhaps didn't go to plan, whether it's the ABA finals, whether it's the Jimmy Cook fight, and Mike McCallum was Michael's one big chance to move on to the world stage against a totally world-class opponent. And in the last round of sparring, Michael broke his nose. That was another watershed moment in Michael's life. By the revised fight time, he had to contend with inactivity. And McCallum then inflicted the second professional defeat on Watson. Michael probably should have had a warm-up fight prior to the McCallum fight. But just in case, I think with the mindset of what happens if something goes wrong in a warm-up fight, we went straight for McCallum. This is a war. Watson's gone. And out. And he will not get up. He fought me at my worst. He struggled to beat me at my worst. I get the hardest part of his life. That's me being at my worst. After the crushing loss, Michael decided to split from Mickey Duff, concerned that he wasn't getting the financial recognition he felt he deserved. A long legal battle followed and a landmark case that inspired other fighters to protect their interests. He took Mickey Duff to court because he said, uh, he said it, was, it was a conflict of interest, him being both the manager uh, and the promoter. Uh, he went to the High Court and he won. Without a doubt, that had a major impact on the sport and, and the Board of Control in, in effect had to change the rules or rewrite the rules and make it uh, more uh, favourable towards the boxer which was very significant. It was back to the boxing business for Michael Watson when eye-catching victories over Errol Christie, Craig Trotter and Anthony Brown led to the super fight the fans had demanded, a mouth-watering match with Chris Eubank.
Eubank is this you know, eccentric, extraordinary person, unbeaten, unblemished record against the man that defeated the greatest of the super middleweights at the time, Nigel Benn, and the one that the public warmed to, you know, the ordinary guy, if you like, rather than the showman. The Watson Eubank fights were initiated because this is the business. You know, the best must fight the best. The first fight, I actually told uh, Michael, Chris is strong, but you can beat him. This is quite an entrance, I tell you. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, whether you like him or whether you hate him, you must admit the guy has got class, the guy has got style. From the first round, I've been complete control. I'm running around the ring, I, every punch I, I hit him, I'm, I, it's screaming. I didn't respect his abilities. I thought I would, you know, I had the beating of him. What a fight. Now this is going to be down to who's the fittest of the two, the two guys and who wants it the most. What I remember of the first fight, that Michael gave Chris a good beating. What a brilliant fight. One of the best, Jimmy, one well, of the best. Guy, this is one of the best I've seen for a long time. Both guys oh, yeah. are going to think they've got the tail. Now it's up to the judges. I'm just waiting to hear a new boy champion. The winner and still... He's got it. The champion of the world. You bank has retained his title. There's lots of people out there that thought Michael Watson won that fight. I know Michael Watson thought he won that fight. You couldn't have argued with the decision, frankly, if it had gone either way very closely. It was a very, very difficult fight to score. Michael didn't do enough to win the fight. When you're fighting a champion, as I was, it has to be taken away from you, not negotiated. I can't explain the feeling. I've never had that feeling before. To have the feeling of injustice in the first fight. Steal the belt, steal the belt away from me. I'll give him his due. He fought good, but I fought like a dog, and that's why I got this decision tonight. And the day after, they had on on the headline on newspaper, Watson robs. A lot of people were totally appalled. What happened? The country went up against me, and every celebrity I can think of came out at the time and said that uh, Michael had been robbed and he deserved the rematch, and I was agitated, but. It's kind of like a game of which I was playing for real. It was, of course, a highly controversial decision. Many felt that Michael had suffered an injustice, which only a rematch could rectify. I said, right, let's do the rematch. And that's, uh, that's where, you know, the whole saga then really began. The momentum in British boxing that had been building from the 1980s really hit the heights in the 90s. Frank Bruno joined Watson, Eubank and Ben as household names. The Watson-Eubank clash had generated heated discussion. A rematch was made for September the 21st, 1991 at White Hart Lane. Chris feared nobody. You know, at the end of the day, he believed in his own ability in the same way as Michael Watson believed in his, which is why it was such a classic confrontation. By now, Jimmy Tibbs was Michael's trainer working at West Ham Amateur Boxing Gym behind the Black Lion. For Watson, there was no escaping the pressure. It came from a fear of letting down his fans and a genuine worry that his fighting future was on the line. The pressure worked for me big time. It gave me, it gave me more drive, more adrenaline. We got training for that fight in West Ham Boys Boxing Club. We brought a lot of sparring partners in. He was wonderful trained, got him highly tuned, he was beautiful. And he always used to skip the gospel music. Marshall won that win so badly. And I think he gave us all. This was gonna be life changing, you know. This was the moment. It was one of the most anticipated rematches in British boxing history. Chris Eubank had won the WBO middleweight title and was undefeated. Now he stepped up for the vacant super middleweight crown. My physical condition is 100%. I've, I, haven't, I haven't felt better in ages. I am the glamour. I am the man. If you want money, you have to come to where I am. 
Michael had been crowned the people's champion and the boxing public turned out in force as he made his way to White Hart Lane. Unbelievably, it would be almost two years before Michael returned home. The second fight changed from my heart, my heart told me to, you know, tonight, you know, big problem. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting and introducing to you from Islington in London, Michael Watson! And his opponent, Chris Eubank! From the referee said box, Michael stayed on me and he backed me up. Like, he's like the man against the boy. We knew what Chris could do. He don't like fighting three minutes around. So we, we made him fight three minutes around. We made him. I've all of them like a rash. He had no control. Every round it was pressure, pressure, body, pressure, body, head, body, body, body. And I'm sure Chris will be the first one to say he's never fought anyone so strong. The Watson fan club wakes up and Watson looking supremely confident at the moment. You're, you're, like a, you're like a piece of rag in the wind. And that's how I was, because it never stopped. He beat me in every single department for 11 rounds. I've got a lot of respect for Michael inside the ring and outside the ring, and um, no person more than me would like to see Michael win a title. Come on, Mike! Oh, it's desperation time for you, Bank. Watson firmly in control. Well, Watson could be on the brink of the world title he wants so badly. I threw everything I had at him in about the, I don't know, just coming up to the second minute. And I had nothing, absolutely nothing left. Eubank slowly running out of gas, just being punched to pieces at the moment here. Watson was so far ahead, Eubank needed the knockout. And there was a flurry of punches, and Eubank went down on his knees. I think for the first time in his career. What a round! What a round! Oh. And he's down! In truth, I wish he had hit me hard enough to actually concuss me so that I genuinely could not carry on. He looked at Michael and waved him forward as if to say, You've got to finish me. I'm going to be, I'm a gladiator. I'm going to be carried out of my shield. I, I moved my right leg forward, my left leg, and I threw an uppercut which caught him. And that effectively won me the fight. Back he comes. Watson is he gone. Don't. He's, He's out completely dead. There's the bell. So that punch, in effect, changed boxing, changed Michael's life. I went, I went down to some corner, and they did their best to revive me. I remember saying to him, "Are you all right? Are you all right?" He said, and the words he used. He went, Jim, I'm fine. And I shouted him to Jimmy, you know, stop the fight, stop the fight, you know, put the tower, stop the fight. Set him in the corner, I asked him again in front of the boxing border control inspector who was in our corner, are you all right? I'm fine, Jim. So I sent him out for the 12th round, so all you've got to do is stand up, don't get hit, you're world champion. There's three minutes of mayhem before us now. Watson still looks groggy. Nobody was to know the damage that was done, and uh, that was the tragedy, uh, sadly. Watson's taking him back to the bend fight and keep his hands up. The referee's on the foot there, just no, dumping he's it. Stopped it. Oh, he's stopped it. Unbelievable. Oh, no. Unbelievable. That is the most incredible end to a world title fight I have ever, I repeat, ever seen in my life.
I was just going to get ready to have a go at the referee, Roy Francis, who was a very, very good referee. But I, I felt him sink in my arms and I thought, oh, yeah, he, he, you know, I thought it was tiredness, fatigue. But um, then he well, then he collapsed and laid on the floor. I felt my spirit leave my body and then I collapsed. And the dead thing went blank. And I didn't know my son was so badly damaged. The first thing I remember out of the fight being in ambulance. I thought I remember being on the stretcher. Like a nightmare. He was raced down to the wrong hospital. It took 45 minutes for him to get any real me medical assistance. It was very, very worrying for everyone. The medical team struggled as Michael fought his hardest battle ever, one of sheer survival. Rushed to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, neurosurgeon Peter Hamlin performed the first of many operations. He was clearly in a very critical condition um, from uh, minutes after the fight. Uh, and by the time he got to us at Bart's Hospital, more than an hour after his injury, uh, things were really very uh, serious indeed. When I realized how serious my son was. I was in shock. We were told that Michael Watson has no chance. We were told he has no chance and he would never live a normal life. Family and friends all gathered at Michael's bedside. It's a night I would like to live over again. Mm -hmm. Michael's real fight only just begun. Michael Watson remains critically ill and on a life support system in the intensive care unit at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, following a second emergency operation to remove a blood clot from his brain. During the night, he has remained critically ill and on life support. His condition deteriorated during the night, requiring a further brain scan in the early hours. He was uh, struggling to survive for well over a month in the intensive care unit, day by day, hour by hour. To have done that for what was 40 days was extraordinary. Looking at him on that bed, it, it, it was a frightening thing. His mum's a Christian lady, and she said, no, he'll pull through. She had faith that he would pull through. The likelihood was for several weeks that he would die. It was the darkest time of Michael's life. I, I, I was all crying in the hospital ward. I was saying to myself, it, it, this for real. For Michael to communicate with you, you ask him um, you, if you're in pain, give me a blink, and he would blink because he couldn't talk. You have to start all over like a baby in everything. Life is too precious to quit. News of his struggles spread worldwide, reaching one special fighter who Michael had always adored. A childhood hero of mine appeared on the ward, um, a man we all know, Muhammad Ali. It's the most extraordinary event in my life to find um, a man such as that appearing on our ward to go visit my patient. I saw this huge figure come through the store, right? And I, rec and I, recognized, the I recognized his face and said, wow, Michael Watson. I can't believe this. This man's mom, Lally. I can't believe this. You're not a bad looking man, are you? You're not a bad looking man, are you? Not a good looking at me. And that gave Michael a boost, you know? And it gave me a boost as well. It gave the family a boost. Until that point, Michael really just looked as if he was surviving each day. There was no joy uh, in what he was going through, and it must have been incredibly hard. Uh, and for the first time, I saw him really interact and 
that smile that uh, we've all learned to love. Michael was transferred to Homerton Hospital, where he began his long rehabilitation. They had to put me in a, in a standing frame to loosen my joints, like Frankenstein. Michael's recovery was a gruelling process as he had to relearn the basics of existence. He was taught how to breathe, eat, walk, talk, and dress himself all over again. Michael continued to astound the experts over the next two years. As soon as he started getting better, you know, he could relate and speak with, with you and that, then they called for me to, to sit in and, and look after Michael. Lenny, that remarkable helper, uh, he always would drive him on. Michael, in the early days, would say, I want to sit down now. Lenny would say, not now. We're going to sit down in a minute. We'll just carry on for a little longer. I believe that Michael will walk out of this in a, in a great way. In 1993, Michael Watson attended his first public event since the accident, a celebrity football match at his beloved Highbury, organised by Ambrose Mendy. It was a chance to raise money for Michael and was an emotional time. It was just floods of, floods of tears and Kevin Campbell, um, Wrighty, did a lap of the stadium. Um, Michael was exhausted, he was hugely crying, but it had happened. And again, what it did for him, you know, and the understanding and realisation that people do care. In 1994, Michael issued a writ against the British Boxing Board. It put in motion the case for damages, which would not only compensate for the lack of efficient medical attention at ringside, but also ensure that boxing was safer in the future. From what I saw of what happened to Michael, uh, I felt very strongly that what ought to be banned was the bad medicine that went with sports. Uh, and in no small part because of what happened to Michael and the way he handled it, um, it has changed immeasurably. And indeed there are boxers who owe their lives um, and their lack of disability uh, to the changes that Michael brought about. There are different people in this life there are amazing people in this world. There are none that match the fighting spirit of Michael Watson. Three years after the Eubank Watson contest, Michael was still battling hard just to walk. He was determined to make a recovery and explored every possibility. Never far from his thoughts, however, was the case against the board. It was quite a blow knowing that, you know, in a profession like boxing, they, they never had the right facilities. You know, the ambulance took him to the wrong hospital. He had to be driven back to another place. It, it, it was, um, it was really, uh, it was just heartbreaking. At the time, I, I think Michael was not well served um, by the British Boxing Board of Control. Michael had to sue the Boxing Board of Control because he had no income. The nine-year legal wrangle ended in victory. The board was found negligent and liable for compensation for Michael's injuries. There is no compensation for the sort of disability that Michael is going to have to live with. But from tragedies, we always have to learn. A lot has been learned from Michael's individual case. Things are different for boxers today. They're different also in other sports as a result of what has been played out so publicly in Michael's case. Now the British Boxing Board of Control are probably the best in the world. Uh, we have, for example, anesthesiologists ringside, we have paramedics, uh, we have uh, annual MRI scans, and, and the rules are so much better. Indeed, many boxers have now benefited from the new rules which have been implemented since Michael's injury. Spencer Oliver was knocked out in a European super bantamweight title defence in 1998 and suffered a blood clot. The medical help he received in the ring was in sharp contrast with Watson's. They call it the golden hour, and they say that you've got to get, you know, operate on within that hour to, you know, to stop any damage or any serious damage being done. And for me, really, I benefited from what happened to Michael because I had a nurse that was working in my corner. When he see me going in and out of consciousness, fortunately for me, they they, they decided to put me in. Um, they sedated me and put me into a coma, and that effectively saved any damage. Michael really was my inspiration. 
Michael continues to inspire the people around him and those that have followed his progress from afar. Throughout his ordeal, he's refused to blame his opponent, Chris Eubank, and the pair were reunited in 2001 amidst highly emotional scenes. I've been praying for you, Chris. You're forgiven. Michael has this fantastic ability to say, what's happened has happened, it's God's will, and I, my job is just to get on with it. In simple words, but the hardest thing in the world to do. Michael's never shied away from a challenge. He and I were talking about the marathon. Somehow it came out that if I'd do it, um, he'd do it. I'll, and if he'd do it, I'd do it. And I took him seriously. Oh yes, without a doubt. This is a guy who, a few months before that, um, he was lucky to walk across the room, let alone 26 miles. When Michael said that he wanted to do it, I was quite confident, because when Michael says he's going to do something, he does it, you know, and he will do it wholeheartedly. Michael trained with the same mindset in which he prepared as a prize fighter. Lenny, Michael and myself, we were accidentally shuffled into the elite athletes pen. So you had a, a rather unfit neurosurgeon uh, with a hemiparetic ex-boxer and his carer pottering around the elite athletes enclosure with people like Paula Radcliffe warming up. So we start the marathon after everybody else and within about 10 minutes, the dustbin vans that come along behind the marathon to clear everything up had overtaken us. The dog days are over. The dog days are done. The horses are coming, so you better run. Run fast for your mother, run fast for your father, run for your children, for your sister. I love to overcome the odds. Up with them, no way would I be able to do it, but. It's been predicted I'll never walk again and I'll never talk again. Well, look what I'm doing now. He was very inspired by um, the public, as he always is. A good time to, to, to remember doing that walk. I can always look back on them days. It will never be forgotten. Michael said he just wanted to stop and talk to this boy. And there's a boy with his parents and he was in a wheelchair. Uh, and uh, they believed um, that he wasn't going to walk again, had a very bad injury. Michael simply said to this child, you need to get out of your chair. And there was this immense shaking of the chair as the kiddie really struggled, really struggled. And uh, up he stood and then took a few steps. Um, everybody was sort of gasping. Um, his parents ran up, he sat back down in the chair again and it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Walking the last mile of the marathon with him, what he would have suffered to actually do that over that six day period, again, is a, is a, is a testament to his irrepressibility. You know, he is and has been unstoppable. It was an amazing triumph for Michael, taking him six days and two hours to complete the marathon. He'd been the people's champion as a boxer, now he was an even more inspirational figure to a far wider audience. Michael went on to receive acclaim with an award for courage and achievement. Then he was rightfully recognised with an MBE. We went to Buckingham Palace. We saw the Queen. The Queen said to me, I'm a remarkable man. And Michael turned around and he said, you're a remarkable woman. You know, I just sounded so cool. <laughs> Despite all his trials and tribulations, Michael Watson's at peace with the world and his role within it. I don't want a person to receive an award. I want to live my life in reality by helping people. One of the most startling lines I heard him come out with was that he thought his injury was a blessing, in that his life now is much better than it was. Uh, he's got a real job. Uh, which he enjoys immensely, and that he's doing good. Despite everything taken from him, Michael continues to give, supporting the Teenage Cancer Trust and using his plight to encourage others. I've been there. I know how exactly they feel. 
You could tell, even just looking into his eyes, that he meant what he said and you could feel what he'd felt. I'm so proud of Michael for the way he inspires sick people. He seemed like a fantastic person to me, to because even though you can be positive yourself, if you have somebody else who's been through a bad situation, it's fantastic to hear their story and to help to they understand on a different level that they've been through the tough times that you have and to see how positive they are and what they he's doing with his life, turning it around, he just seemed like a fantastic person to meet. Well, I think young people get stuck in a tunnel thinking that they're the only people in the world and the only person in the world to have been hit by a cancer diagnosis or anything similar to that. And so to have someone coming externally and just go, hey, do you know what, I've been through it too and you can get through it, there is a way. It might not be as easy, it, you might not come out the same, but it is possible, there is a way. It spurred me on because obviously everybody has low days and this past couple of months it's been quite difficult to get back in and get going and for him, somebody who's been through it and has obviously been through the tough times and needing the motivation, he's motivated me more to get on and fight with life and to carry on and anything's possible. Boxers are our heroes, but the real hero is someone that comes through the challenges that Michael Watson has come through, holds his head high, bears no remorse, and lives a life that is a huge credit to him and mankind generally. And he's a huge inspiration to me and any of the boxers out there. Um, he really is. The, the doctor said, if I do survive, then I'll be cabbage. Or find cabbage eye on me. There's the spirit of a fighter is someone who doesn't give up. And, you know, he encapsulates that. But the best of it, um.